Okay, um, it is good to be here, it's good to be back. You know, it's on one hand, there are times we have to be gone, but it's always nice to be back together with uh, the people that we are with regularly. Last weekend, we had a special privilege, Heather and I, we got to celebrate her dad's 80th birthday, and we had family from, I th there was over 100 people on one day, and everybody was related in some way. Um, I think we counted six different Asian nationalities. Um, there were African Americans in that family. There are um, Ukrainians. There, are, uh, like, you go around and uh, Hispanic. I, it, it was quite a thing, and and it, for me, it was like a little, little, tiny glimpse of heaven. 
right? All nations, people are going to be there praising him, worshiping him. And uh, it was a great time last weekend, and it just uh, kind of whets my appetite for what it's going to be for eternity um, there. Today, I would like you to just look around and wave at somebody that you haven't seen in a while, maybe, or uh, um, say hello. Real quickly, though, let's try not to leave our seats, and we'll get on with announcements and the rest of our talk. Okay, um, announcements. Women's Fellowship will be tomorrow, 6 p.m. at the Sablons House. Um, guys are going to be the following Tuesday, Tuesday, not Monday. Um, we're still trying to decide on the location for that. Uh, small groups, you need to see the Wilsons if you think that might be something that you're interested in. And um, let's just remember, if we can think of that picture of last weekend or what heaven's going to be like when we're... Uh, around people that from all parts of the earth, people that love God and are following him, and what a great time that is going to be. Let's make sure that we're letting people around us know about him. That uh, the, mo the best way that we can say that we like or love someone is, is not to laugh with them or do some other things that are great, but it's actually, it's actually to let them know about Jesus. It's actually to help them come to a, a redeeming relationship with him. And so let's uh, keep that on the forefront of what we're doing. At this time, if you can, please stand for the reading of Scripture. We're going to be reading from Habakkuk 2, verses 1 through 5. I will take my stand in my watch post and station myself on the tower. And look out to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples.
Lamentations chapter 3, verses 24 through 26 says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Lord, may we wait upon you. May we trust you, Lord. May we know who our Father is. May we know who Jesus Christ, our Savior, is every day. May we draw nearer to you. May we know your voice. And may we not just know it, Lord. May we be obedient to it. May we desire to be obedient to your spirit. May your spirit reign here now, Father. We worship you, the creator of the universe, Lord. Not because of what we can gain, Lord, but because of who you are. That you decided to create us, Lord, knowing that we would fail. Knowing that we would fall away. But that in turn, you would make a way for us to come back. That you are a righteous and holy God. That you are just in all your ways. It will never be enough, Lord, praising you, Father. But may we praise you continuously every day with our lives, Lord, with the way we live and the way we talk, with who we reach, Father, Lord, for your name's sake and for your glory, Lord. So may we praise you now, Father. Come down in this place, Lord. Bless us, Lord, with your presence. I have this hope as an anchor for my soul. Through every storm, I will hold to. swept away in everything I will trust in you there is hope
Jesus, as we're entering into our last song, as we're praising you, as we're worshiping you, Lord, may our hearts and our minds be focused on you right now. May this just be a time between you and us, Father God. Come down upon this place, Lord, that we would surrender our hearts over you wholly, Lord. That we would know what it is to praise our King and our God, Lord. What it is to glorify you in this place right now, Jesus. May we praise you. May we honor you, Lord, with our worship, Lord. It's all about you. No one else.
Lord Jesus, may you wash over us. May it be more of you every day. More of you that fills us, Lord. More of you that transforms us, Lord. Lord, you are the potter, Lord. We are the clay. Shape us, Lord. Grow us. May our lives just shout who you are, Lord. And may we know our God, Lord, deeper and deeper, Lord. Knowledge and wisdom of you, Father, is never ending. It is endless, Lord. It is infinite, Lord. May each day be a day of drawing nearer to our Lord and our King. And may we praise you. May our lives worship you, Father, and no one and nothing else. May you reign over our hearts, Lord, over our minds and our lives, Lord. You be the foundation. You lead the way, Lord. We are obedient to your voice. Reign in this place now, Father God. I pray that your spirit, Lord, that it would anoint Pastor David, that he'd speak your truth, Lord, and that as he's speaking your truth, Lord, as you are speaking, Father God, that we would listen. We would hear the voice of our King and our Savior, Jesus, we praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to Timberland. Thank you guys for coming today. In our prayers this morning, you know, I talk about it often. You know, we come on Sunday, we come to fellowship, we come to encourage each other. Um, you know, we come to have an encounter with God. We, we come for so many reasons, you know. Um, but something that may escape us at times is that really when we come together, our fellowship obviously needs to be grounded in Christ, but really we come together as a family and our, and our hope is that we would encourage each other as family members, like bro what Brother Tim was talking about this morning about his, his family, you know, Heather's dad's 80th anniversary, or excuse me, 80th birthday. <laughs> um, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, when they came together, I mean, yeah, they came together for a common reason to celebrate, you know, uh, the birthday, right? But at the same time, I mean, there was bonding going on. There was love, you know. That fellowship was in truth. It wasn't just checking off a list. And so I just uh, want to thank you guys for that here at Timberland and what we are. You know, we are um, a family. And, you know, we step up for each other. We care for each other. We, we are concerned and, and um, you know, we hope for each other. And so I just want to thank all of you for that. I mean, this is not just about coming to church on Sunday and saying, Lord, okay, I went to church this week, I'm good. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's about what happens when we come together uh, in fellowship. So thank you guys so much. As you guys know, uh, we've been going through Romans. We just started last week, and we finished the first seven verses of chapter one. Um, we're going to continue today in chapter one. I just really quickly wanted to remind you, the first seven verses of Romans is Paul's greeting. And he took that time to give his credentials, if you will, um, the authority that he had or that he had been given, I should say, and the call that God had placed on his life and that he had heeded to and obeyed. And specifically, that call was by God to deliver to all the nations, the Gentiles, right, God's gospel. Now, this is a gospel as we know it, right, that offers people God's grace, God's peace. Obviously, it's received through faith in his son, Jesus. And Jesus, even in the greeting here, verses 1 through 7, is the center of the gospel. He's the very source of the power of the gospel. Paul's life's purpose is God's gospel. And so this is why I believe he had such a strong opening greeting to this letter. If you look at other greetings in some of his other epistles, you know, they're all great, 
right? But this one is just so strong in just really hitting this, this, this truth home. Again, his credentials, his authority, the fact that he's all about the gospel. Not only is he all about the gospel, but he's, he's about the gospel because God has called him to be the deliverer of the gospel to the nations. And so he makes no qualms about it. He, he is he's a strong opening in this greeting. It's all about his call to bring that gospel. And I believe that another reason why the greeting was so strong is to acknowledge or rather the Romans, that they would acknowledge his authority in writing all that he writes in Romans going forward. And so that way, as he's writing it, and they're, whether they're reading it, they realize that it's based on this authority that is God-given. In other words, they should believe in it, they should you know, apply it, they should live it out. And so I want you guys to see this again, um, as we do with all of the Bible. Um, this wasn't just for the Romans then, okay? It was to the Romans, right? But it's for all Christians for all time. And so just like the Romans were expected to respond, right, to what Paul was, writes in this book, in this letter, uh, we also are called to respond by applying it to our lives. And so I hope, guys, as we continue in this, this journey in Romans, that, um, that that's what you'll do. I hope that you will apply these truths to your life. And so today we got uh, verses 8 through 18 in Romans 1. And so I don't want to spend too much more time in this intro. I just wanted to kind of present that to you guys. I want to get right into the text. So let me pray one more time, and then we will unpack it. Father God, again, we just come before you, Lord. Um, your very spirit, God, as you are reigning here now, that you would speak through me and that you would speak to the people that are hearing this message today, God, that you would open their ears and open their eyes, uh, cleanse and wash us with your word today, God, draw us closer to you in your truth. And again, Lord, let it all bring you honor and glory. Again, we love you. We praise you in Jesus name. Amen. So verse eight, I'm just going to pick up there uh, because again, Paul has just given his greeting and, and look at that, look at that word here in verse eight. He says, first, Okay. And I, I think that's, that's a big deal, right? Often we just kind of gloss right over these words, right? But he says, first. And so I think what follows this, you know, is a very important thing. What does Paul say? He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Guys, often we will come to the Lord and there'll be no thanksgiving, you know? I'm not saying that, you know, we, we, we purposely aren't thankful to God, Right? But I think we don't always acknowledge all of the things that God has done, is doing, and is going to do in our lives. And so Paul is like, you know what? <laughs> okay, I gave my greeting, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to thank God, <laughs> you know? And I think, guys, it's really important to be thankful to God. This very apostle Paul writes to be thankful in all things. Let us rejoice always. Let us be thankful in all, in all things, guys. So he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ, or Christ, through Jesus Christ for all of you. He says, and this is the reason, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So guys, Paul gave us the grand greeting, gave us his credential, and confessed that his life's purpose is the gospel of God. He writes to the Corinthians, I do all for the sake of the gospel, right? This is his life's purpose, right? And so his Desire is, is that the gospel would be evangelized in all the world. And you know what? He recognizes that it actually was being evangelized through all the world through the faith of the Romans. And he's thankful for that. These are not just words. This is not just lip service. Paul is thankful for this truth. Because again, indeed, his life's purpose, his very reason for living at this point is for the glory of God and to evangelize his gospel. So I love this too because Paul says not only as he is thanking God for the faith of the Romans, but he's like, look, God, my thankfulness <clears throat> comes through Jesus Christ. Like, I can't come to you and be thankful in and of myself. I acknowledge that it's because of Jesus that you would even hear me, let alone receive my thankfulness. And so I love that. He says, I thank God through, through Jesus Christ, right? And, and again, because of the faith 
of all of the Roman church. Guys, this is Christian zeal at its best. I, I don't think, again, that Paul is just using words here. I don't think he's trying to, like, you know, rally the troops or motivate the peeps. I, I think what he's doing here is he's speaking a truth, and he's obviously inviting them into that, right? But these are literally things that Paul has in the depths of his heart, right, about people that are people of faith. In other words, people that are his kin in the faith. So I say this, brothers and sisters, let us be thankful to God, just like Paul is here, for each other, specifically for each other's faith. How many people do you know in your life that don't have any faith in God? They don't care to look at God. They don't want to know God. They think faith is silly. They think it's like a, I don't know, like, you know, just believing, make believe or something like that. Or you have like an imaginary friend. You know, we watched uh, that movie If a couple of weeks ago with Ryan Reynolds, you know, and it's about imaginary friends and stuff, you know. And one of the things that, as my wife and I, we got through watching it, one, one of the things that came out of it for us was it was literally like, man, that's like the Holy Spirit, you know. And, and the movie was, it seemed like it was promoting people, like, you know, going back to their childhood and taking on an imaginary friend, right? Because you see, like, an adult guy going to an interview, and he's all feeling down and sad, and then all of a sudden, he remembers his imaginary friend who's always with him, and he gets all happy again, you know, literally stealing the glory of God, right? But for us guys, we have the Holy Spirit. We don't need to have an imaginary friend. We don't have an imaginary friend. This is real. This is true. We have the Holy Spirit of God. So let us be thankful to God for the faith that we have. Let us be thankful to God for the faith of our brothers and sisters that they have. Because, guys, it shouts the truth that no matter where we are, no matter what we go through, we're never alone. God is with us. God does not leave us. God does not forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. Guys, let our faith be lived out so righteously, right, that just like what Paul is so happy about the Romans here, it's said about us. Let us live out our faith so righteously that it's proclaimed in our community and beyond for Jesus. Do you see this? Like Paul's writing this letter, it's about 57 to 58 AD, hasn't been to Rome, and yet he's hearing about the great faith of these people. He's not in Rome, he's not even close to Rome, right? And yet he's hearing about the great faith of these people. Let's continue there, verse 9. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. And so, just this statement here that he makes, God is my witness. In the Greek, that's literally like an oath. You know, it's like saying, you know, guys, you can trust what I'm going to say. I promise you, with all of my heart, that that I definitely, as God is my witness, right, mention you, right, in my prayers, right? He's about to say that in verse 10. But, but he's saying, I mention you often. And like, look, I promise you that this is the truth. I'm not messing with you. I'm not, again, not just using words to try to motivate you. This is the true thing. And he says this, guys. He says, again, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. You guys know that when we serve from the Spirit, it's literally like we serve from our hearts. And that when you gave your life to Christ, you became a new creation. And that when you became a new creation, your spirit came alive because it became mingled, joined with the Holy Spirit. And Paul is like, look, I don't serve God with my might, with my strength, with my wisdom, with my feet, with my hands. I serve God with my heart. Because my heart, my spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit of God. I serve God by the Holy Spirit. I just think that's really, really cool, guys. Verse 10, again, that without ceasing I mention you, verse 10, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. And so, guys, look, like I just said, Paul hadn't got to Rome yet, right? He kept praying to God that he'd get to Rome, but he hadn't gotten to Rome yet, guys. All right? And listen, not only is he praying to God, like, get me to Rome, but he's like, let me, just, let me just read that to you again. He says, always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by my will? No, he says, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul prayed uh, without ceasing, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm positive that often we will pray 
I'm sure that some of you probably pray all the time. Maybe you're prayer warriors, and you pray without ceasing. Guys, but you know one of the hardest things to pray is? Not my will, Lord, thy will. <laughs> right? Because we want God to do what we want him to do. Because often we think our way is going to be the right way, or we think our way is going to be the easiest way, or we think our way is the best way, and yet it's not God's will. And guys, listen, Paul again, longing to get to Rome, saying, look, I pray without ceasing that by God's will I would get to you, right? He doesn't get to Rome in the time that he wants to get, hence he's longing to get there, right? And he certainly doesn't get to Rome how he thought he was going to get there, a free man ready to deliver the gospel. He gets there as a prisoner. You guys understand what I'm saying? But here's the point of this, guys, is that, look, Paul was not, once he got to Rome, he was not disappointed. He was not complaining. You know this if you read all of Paul's life, all of his ministry life in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, if you looked in the book of Acts, once you get past chapter 10, about chapter 11, you're going to find that most of the book of Acts, which has 28 chapters, is about Paul's ministry. His ministries, I should say, right? But he wasn't disappointed. He was fully um, submissive to the will of God and to the way God was going to get him there and to the timing that God was going to get, was going to get him there, guys. Do you guys see that? And so, again, he's just praying. Okay, it isn't happening, you know. Often, well, here's what we do. Okay, God, I've been praying for six months, so I'm just going to stop praying because that must mean you, you, you must not want me to have it or you must not want me to do it. Guys, I promise you, God doesn't work that way, Okay. God doesn't say, hey, listen, by my silence, that's the answer, okay? God will let you know if it's a yes or it's a no. You are his children. When my kids come to me and they ask me for something, I don't just like look at them and say, hmm, and walk away. You know what I'm saying? I might say, hey, you know what, guys? Let me think about that, and then I'll get back to you. Or I might just right then and there say yes or no. But me being a loving father and at the same time a wicked person, Love my kids enough <laughs> that I'm not going to let them hang like that. I'm not just going to say, well, you guess and you think. Or maybe I won't say anything to you and you know what that means. That's not the way God works. God absolutely will answer you whether it's yes or no. God absolutely will fulfill the prayer that you've asked him, whether it's yes or no. And it will be in his time, guys. So my encouragement to you in this today, my exhortation, if you will, is to just keep praying. Until you know God has answered you. Just keep praying. You know, God loves you. And he loves when his kids come to him and ask him things. Anybody here who's a parent, listen, and I know it isn't always this way, but I actually do love when my kids come to me and ask me for stuff. I know sometimes you have these kids that are like really high maintenance and real needy and they ask you something every five minutes. Well, why is this? And how about this? And how about that? You know, and eventually after a while you guys, hey, you know what, just give me a break for a minute. Come back later or something, right? Or, hey, you've, you've had your 20 questions for the day. No more, okay? That's not God. God doesn't do that. God's taking requests all day long and he loves it, guys, because our hearts, our posture, right, are aimed towards him. And that's what he longs for. He hopes for that, this great relationship as our father, we as his children, a loving father, an intimate relationship, guys. So please, don't stop praying until you know for sure that God has said no. Keep praying. And when you pray, pray by the will of God. Pray that God's will be done. Make your petitions known, but say, God, not my will, thy will. Remember Jesus. If you take this cup from me, please take it from me, Father, but not my will, thy will. Jesus had an idea, right? But he's like, not my will, thy will be done. <clears throat> Let's continue there, verse 11. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So guys, again, as I said a moment ago, Paul longed to see the Romans And look, he didn't just want to come and see them and have a party like, again, what Brother Tim was talking about. You know, you just come together so you can laugh and, you know, have a good time partying or whatever, right? Like, yes, God loves when we do that, right? But he wants us when we come together, whether it's a party, right, a potluck here at church, a Bible study, whatever it is. He wants us when we come together to come so that each of us would be encouraged spiritually, right? Literally strengthening each other's faith in Jesus Christ. 
This is the motive that Paul had in longing to come to Rome. It wasn't like, man, you know, I heard Rome is a party city, man. I want to just get there, man. You know, I want to get to the gas lamp, you know, over there and just, you know, party on. You know, no. Paul wanted to go and be encouraged and encourage the believers, the church, the body of Christ in Rome. He longed for that. It was his very great desire and passion to do that, guys. Literally wanting to build up God's kingdom and all who are a part of it. So guys, let our motive when we come together, the motive of our fellowship, be the same as Paul's here, you know, to spiritually strengthen each other's faith. I know sometimes you come to church and it's just been a bad week. Maybe it was a rough morning getting to church, you know. Uh, you know, whatever it is, guys. But look, I promise you, if you come for somebody else's gain, you know, which literally is the epitome or definition of the word agape, love, right? The other person, not me, the other person, right? If you do that, I promise you, Jesus promises that you will be blessed, guys. Let our motive in fellowship be that somebody else would gain. Again, um, as I always say, guys, we have it in our announcements that we should try to get together. Let's do life together. This really shows the vital importance of fellowship, these two verses 11 and 12, right? And yet many today didn't go to church, right? They said, well, I caught a podcast yesterday, or, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go online and listen to my favorite pastor or whatever, right? And look, guys, I'm not saying if you're sick, you know, you should not you know, stay home and, you know, and, and, and mend. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that there are a lot of folks that try to justify not attending church at all or not try to justify not attending Bible studies or not attending fellowships with other believers, and yet they will run to a sporting event or they'll run here or they'll run there. They'll make sure, well, I can't miss that, you know? And look, guys, there are times, right? Like, even like, again, I'm sorry, Brother Tim, I keep talking about you. But like, you know, last week they went to go celebrate a really awesome thing. Like, daddy was turning 80, that's a big deal, right? And so sometimes you gotta do that, you know, and that's okay. But that's, those are exceptions, right, guys? And look, a lot of people know going to church is the exception. Going to a Bible is the exception. Well, if I got nothing else to do, I guess I'll go, you know. And it's just sad, guys. Fellowship with like-minded believers is absolutely vital to your walk, right, and your growth and to the walk and the growth of your brothers and sisters that God puts in your life. So I, I ask, guys, and I pray that we greatly desire fellowship with each other with the body of Christ, just like Paul here. Again, the purpose of fellowship is for building up. And you know what? When we're doing that, we just so happen get to, to, to get to laugh <laughs> and to grow with each other and get to know each other. It's beautiful. Again, uh, during prayer time today, I was like, you know, you might want to really, you know, get this fellowship thing down because you know what? Uh, Eternity is a long time, <laughs> you know, so we're going to be in fellowship together in communion, right, with God and each other for eternity. That is a long time. Start practicing it now and get used to it, guys, okay? Verse 13, it says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I've been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the Gentiles. So, guys, you know, Paul, he's just really awesome the way he's starting some of these things that he's saying, right? In the beginning, he said, verse 8, he says, first this, right? Um, and then what did he say? Um, he says, um, uh, uh, he says, for God is my witness, you know, and the next, in verse 9, for God is my witness, you know. And now he makes this other, you know, this other statement, you know, in verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, you know, like, Paul is just awesome. You know, like, there's nothing hidden with Paul, you know, like, he's just all out there, guys. And look. Paul actually uses this statement a few times in some of his other letters, okay? But look, what this is showing us, guys, is that Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, writing this letter to the church, right, that he is always forthcoming with his motives. Always forthcoming with his motives. And brothers and sisters, I hope that all of us can be the same way. Paul, or excuse me, Jesus is like, don't let anything be done in the dark. Don't let anything be in the dark because eventually everything is going to be brought into the light. So again, brothers and sisters, let it all hang out, okay? Let your motive be known 
by your brothers and sisters. Look, guys, I, I, I'm not saying that you don't have this gift, but me, I don't have the gift to look into somebody's heart, right? All right? And, and know what they're thinking or know what they're feeling, all right? So what I'm saying is, is that the motives that they, you know, are coming from when they tell me something or whatever aren't always plain to me. But yet I can make in my own mind what I think their motive is, even though that may be not the truth, that their motive may be the exact opposite of what I'm thinking. How many times have you guys read a text or an email where you thought somebody's motive was something bad or something that was thought bad of you? And then you come to find out that, no, that's not, that's not it at all, right? And so, guys, I think for the sake of encouragement and edification and also heading the enemy off at the past who's always trying to wreak chaos and havoc in the church, right? I think that all of us should communicate well with each other. I think we all should be forthcoming with our motives, guys. This is a very awesome principle and practice that we can, that we can just put into practice right now and that's going to really extinguish a lot of those darts that the enemy shoots at us from each other, guys. All right. Now, again, uh, as he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. He says that I often have often intended to come to you. Um, what you call it. Um, this has been a long time that Paul has intended to come to, to, to the Romans, right, to that Roman church. Now, I want you to see that Paul was actually converted in the year 34 A.D. He's writing this letter in the year 57 A.D., which means that's about 23 years and he still hasn't come, right, to the church there. Now, um, he started ministry with Barnabas, his first minist uh, missionary journey, about 48 AD. Even that is a long time to not come to see the Romans, you know. And so Paul is like, guys, look, right, checking motives, right? <laughs> like, I wanted to come to you. It's not like I didn't want to come see you. I genuinely did. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the enemy might be messing with people's heads, making them think, well, Paul doesn't really care for us. He doesn't care what happens. I hear all these things that's going on with Paul, right? You got, and you guys, look, they didn't have internet. They didn't have email. They didn't have cell phones, right, or texting, none of that stuff, right? They had something that I believe was equally as great. It was called the Roman road system that, that led to every place. And so it was like a, an information superhighway because stuff would get carried, you know, placed or, or from Rome to, to another place or from that place to Rome. It was just information flowing all over the place, guys, okay? And so they would have known about what was going on with Paul. As a matter of fact, when Paul first got converted and he came to Jerusalem, you know, um, or excuse me, when he got to Antioch, remember what happened. Like the, the, the guy there, he was like that God wanted to use to take the scales off of Paul's eyes. He's like, Lord, are you sure you want me to go, uh, you know, talk, talk to Paul? I've been hearing some really uh, disturbing things about this guy. He's like persecuting the church. How did he hear that? And it's literally like 300 miles away because of the roads, because people talk and he gets around. And so again, this church would have known the work that Paul had been doing, especially 23 years into his conversion, especially nine or 10 years into his ministry, Right? And yet he still hasn't come. And so Paul is like, look, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, you are important to me. <laughs> I want you to know that I've always intended to come to you. But I love this guy. It said that he had been prevented up to this point. Again, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. All right, guys. So this is what I want to tell you guys is this, okay? It's like, look, if you are praying to God about something, all right, and I believe now you're going to continue to pray without ceasing, right? With, and not just think, well, God's silence means no, right? He's going to keep praying, right? But if you do and God hasn't told you no, you're still praying without ceasing, okay? Let's never say that it hasn't happened yet because the enemy is preventing it. I think it's easy for us to say, oh, Paul was prevented because the enemy was just doing all these things to him. No, Paul was prevented by God. Paul was on God's time. Paul's life's purpose, his life's mission, as he confesses in the beginning of this letter, is the gospel of God. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I, we are not prevented from anything, right, by the enemy. It's by God. And you know what? If God is preventing us, right, 
That's a good thing. It's not time. You know, maybe, maybe he's trying to build us up. Maybe he's trying to prepare us for what we're going to endure and experience when we get to that thing or we have to go through that thing. But so often, guys, I don't know if you're like me. I'm a little bit anxious, you know, I am. And sometimes I just want it, I just want it to happen. I just want to go through it, you know. Even if, like, if I know something, I have to go through something, it's going to be hard. Well, I just want to go through it, you know. I think we need to just take a step back and just think about the cares for today, not tomorrow, not next week, not the new season that we're going to come into that might even be a hard season, and just rest in Christ and wait for God before he decides when he's going to take us through that. And again, the enemy can't prevent you from anything, brothers and sisters. You carry the, the Holy Spirit of God. You are more than conquerors. You are invincible. Until God says you come home, you will be here. Until God says your ministry is done, you will continue to do ministry. You understand what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? We know that. God is the one who's like, baby boy, it's not time for you yet. But it's coming. Don't worry. It's coming. And so often we just want to jump. We just want to leap, right? So again, we see some motives here from Paul. And this is awesome, guys, because as I just said in verse 12, where Paul wrote that, you know, he wants to be mutually encouraging to them. In other words, he wants to encourage them, like he longs to come to them so he can encourage them and they can encourage him, right? Giving his motives, right? Um, but now he gets into some details here towards the end. He says, at the end of verse 13, I should say, he says, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Okay, here we go. Paul's life purpose, the gospel. Paul's like, look, I want to bear fruit. I want to bear fruit in your life, and I want to bear fruit in bringing new believers into the body. This is, this is like his motive here. He, he's not trying to conceal this, right? I mean, I have talked to people in the past, and, you know, I, I actually, we had, when we had the thing uh, a couple years back, the, the, the dinner, uh, you know, the alumni dinner or the, the, the day that we had out here, I talked to a guy, and he's like, yeah, you're just trying to get me, you know, to, to believe in Jesus. So, yeah, bro, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm not hiding that, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm not trying to trick you. I don't want, you know, I'm not trying to get you to come to our church so you can, I can get your tithes from your hands, you know. I just don't want you to die without Christ. You better believe that's what I'm trying to do, you know. And, and, and this is what Paul is saying his ultimate motive is. Again, I'll read it to you at the end of 13. He says, in order that I may reap some harvest, in other words, bear fruit among you, that's the existing body of, in Rome, the existing body of Christ, among you, right, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. That's the rest of the Gentiles in Rome that aren't saved yet. That's his motive. He wants to build up, again, the body of Christ, and he's not hiding it at all. I love that so much, guys. Verse 14, he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Now, often, you know, we, that word obligation, you know, um, can be like in a negative context. Like, you know, if I told one of my children, man, I'm obligated to you. Man, I hate it. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it could be a very negative thing. But I think what Paul is doing here is he's writing or speaking in hyperbole, as he often does. I think you guys will agree. And I think he's saying, like, I literally have no choice. Like, and, and, and again, he's chosen this life, right? He's literally, remember at the beginning in his greeting, he says, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Like, this is something that he's chosen and he submits to. And by faith, he walks in this. But it's such a strong conviction of his, he feels like he is obligated. And he's not only, he not only does he feel that way, but he's like, look, I am so much about the gospel and obligated to the furthering of the kingdom, the furthering of the gospel and the building of the kingdom, right? That I'm not just about trying to reach Greeks, but I'm also about trying to re reach barbarians. Now, you know, don't get confused, okay? It wasn't like, I used to watch this cartoon back in the 80s called Thunder the Barbarian, okay? And this guy was, I don't know if anybody did, you know, it was kind of a cool cartoon. Um, but this guy was kind of like rough and rude and, you know, he had like a couple of people that kind of went around the, you know, it was like post-apocalypse earth, right? And he's running around like being a savior to different people, helping people with their problems and stuff. And 
One, one of the people that come, there's, there's, there's two others. One's a monster, like a mutant. But the other one's this, this, this lady, this woman. And he often offends her because he just doesn't know any better. You know what I'm saying? Like, he says things like a barbarian would, being rude, right? Being harsh, right? And so, literally, when Paul says a barbarian, he means, like, foreigners, even to Greeks. People that don't speak Greek. People that if you heard them, you might think, wow, this person's like a foreigner, you know? And you know, guys, I, look, I, I often talk about this. I'm a mutt, all right? I, I have, my, my family is predominantly Guamanian, but my dad's dad is white, and from what I, I think, I think he has French in him and maybe some Irish, and maybe some German. I'm about as muttly as muttly gets, okay? Um, so, you know, um, I, I don't speak those other languages or the dialect of Guamanian, you know? Um, but often I think when people come like that, whether they have an accent that we are not familiar with, or maybe their, their English is broken, right? I think often we see them in that light. And Paul is like, look, I'm going to speak the gospel to everybody. I don't care if they're just like thee who speaks Koine Greek, right? Like all of civilization, or if they are a barbarian. And Paul is not trying to be insulting to them. These Romans would have understood what he meant. He, they, they, they would have known that he meant foreigners, right? And Rome, the hustle and bustle of it, had all kinds of different ethnicities flowing in through it. It was, it was a flourishing, flourishing city, guys. So Paul is saying, look, I am obligated to everybody to preach the gospel to everybody, guys. And so, look, this is what I want us to get out of this, okay, is I want us to never dub a person unworthy of the gospel based on outside appearances. Now, some of you are saying, Dave, I would never do that, okay? But what if you knew a person that they always were like criminal, right? Or they were doing wicked things in the community, right? Would you hold back the gospel from them, especially if you felt like God was leading you to do that? I mean, or God puts that person in your path? I hope that you wouldn't do that because Paul is saying, me being a deliverer of the gospel to the Gentiles, it doesn't matter if they're proper Gentiles or improper Gentiles, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to speak the truth and preach the gospel of Christ. So brothers and sisters, please don't dub somebody unworthy of that. So verse 15, let's finish up there with that verse. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Again, he's saying this on the, on the heels of him, just got through saying, I will bring the gospel to everybody, be them Greek, be them foreign, right? But I love this, guys, because literally what Paul is saying here in verse 15 is he's telling you, <clears throat> or he's telling us, you know, how, you know, that he's going to use, rather, the gospel to accomplish all that he just mentioned in verses 8 through 14. So what I want you to see here, guys, and, and look, what did he just mention in 8 through 14? I, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. To build up the existing body of Christ in Rome and to add new souls to the church in Rome. This is why he wanted to come, okay? Um, but he tells us how he intends to accomplish that. He's going to use the gospel. In other words, he's going to use the word of God. All right, guys? And so look, what I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, and look, I, I'm not judging anybody. I'm not God's gift to, uh, to pastoring. I'm, our church, I don't think, is greater than another church. We're just another work, you know, that God has put in place to be a light. But guys, some of the things that I see going on in some of the churches with the smoke and the lights, um, a, a few weeks ago, I saw this one where they literally, during church, this is during a church service, they had like family feud day where they had people on each side and the pastor was in the middle and they're literally like at their hands behind their back to get in. This is during a church service, you know. Another church service, I had, there were people on the, trape on the trapeze, you know, and the a, a, a tight wire walking across, you, you know. I mean, guys, we don't need that. <laughs> we need the word of God. We need the gospel of God. We need the truth of Christ, guys. And that's all we need. It is more than sufficient for the building up of the body of Christ and the calling of new souls into the body of Christ. And Paul's like, look, there's not going to be a circus act. We're not going to have a carnival after church to try to get you to come. 
We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to proclaim the gospel of Christ, and that will be enough. Brothers and sisters, please, all we need is the gospel. All we need is the word, uh, is the word of God. And the reason why that, guy, that is, guys, is because the gospel of God, the word of God, points us back to Jesus. <laughs> Do you guys see this? It points us back to Jesus Christ, again, as I've said and have been saying, is the very center and uh, source of the power of the gospel. So, brothers and sisters, let us be eager, like Paul, to proclaim the gospel, God's word, to everyone that we can. God's gospel, often we see it as just kind of like a one-time thing. We hear it one time, and we either get saved or we don't get saved. And if we don't, you know, if this person gets saved or not, well, then if they don't get saved, I'll tell them the gospel again next time I see them. But after they get saved, we're good. Guys, the gospel is not just a one-time thing. The gospel is not just meant to call us to, 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 to a saving faith. It's also meant to edify us evermore. There's so much more that we can gain from understanding God's gospel more and more, deeper and more intimately. And you guys are saying, but it's so easy, Dave. Look at John 3, 16. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's so easy. Really, you guys may not realize this, but do you know that if you did a high-level view of Romans and you went from chapter 1, verse 18, really verse 19, that everything Paul talks about until he gets to chapter 15, verse 13, is about the gospel. Everything. That is how deep the gospel is. And crazily, it's not even the fullness of the gospel that Paul gives in detail from Romans 119 to Romans 1513. I bet you never looked at Romans that way, have you? But it literally is the, the nuts and the bolts of the gospel. It is enough. The word of God is enough. I love the meticulous details of God's gospel that Paul gives throughout this whole letter to the Romans. Literally, again, showing that it is his life's purpose and his life's passion, the gospel of God. Let's go to verses 16 through 18. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this verse 16 right here, the first part of this, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. There is the word for. Okay, that word, and please correct me, uh, Mrs. Miller, I'm not an English teacher, um, but that word I think is what's called a conjunction, okay? And what I mean by that is it is connecting what he just got through saying in verse 15, right, to verse 16. Let me read to you verse 15 again. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And he says, for, or you could say, because I am not ashamed of the gospel. Do you see this, guys? Now, you're thinking probably, how could Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Well, I don't know if you guys knew this, but in the ancient world, um, the gospel was a stumbling block to Jews, and it was foolishness to Greeks. Paul actually writes that in 1 Corinthians 17 through 24, okay? What he writes in those verses is that, in, you know, in the light of the gospel, is that Jews were seeking a sign and Greeks were seeking wisdom. And it's so sad because God's gospel is both of those things, but the carnal person can't see that. God's, God's gospel or the, the, the essence or the substance of the gospel, Christ on a cross, literally is the sign, <laughs> right? The essence of the gospel, Christ on a cross, literally is the wisdom that the Greeks have been seeking. And yet the carnal person cannot see that, guys. This is a time when, in the ancient times, where, you know, honor, you know, um, uh, you know uh, shame, they were very serious things. I know that often we hear about, like, the Japanese, how honor is a, a, very, a very serious thing. You know what, guys? In this time, honor and shame was a very serious thing. And so, you know what? Paul didn't care. Paul didn't care that it might bring embarrassment to his flesh, right, as people look at it, the Jews, as a stumbling block. Or Greeks look at it as foolishness. He did not care, guys. You could see how, as I just said, 
honor and shame are very serious. Today, is honor and shame very serious? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I, I've never actually went to a pride parade, but some of the things that goes on at a pride parade is the epitome of shame and the epitome of dishonor. People get on, you know, TikTok or, or make these YouTube shorts and, 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 and the whole premise of what they're trying to give to the public so that they can get a bunch of views and likes so they can get a bunch of money from the commercials that come from those things, the very thing is dishonor some of the things that they do, and they freely do it because it's the way of the world, especially in our day and age. Obviously, as, I'm just, as I've just said, honor is not as serious as it once was before. Yet, sadly, brothers and sisters, we're still embarrassed and ashamed to tell others God's gospel about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Let us be excited let us be zealous. Let us be passionate about the gospel. Let us tell the world about the gospel. And this is the reason why. Look at the second half of that verse 16. Again, you see that conjunction, right? That conjunction word for, right? He says, for or because it is the power of God for salvation. This is why I'm not ashamed of it, because it saves people. And yet we don't want to tell our neighbors or we don't want to tell our friends or our family members because they're going to make fun of me or they're going to think less of me or I might lose a friend. Brothers and sisters, you think you're losing a friend in the world now? Wait, wait, wait until you go up to heaven one day and realize that your friend that you had an opportunity to tell the gospel to and didn't ain't there. Talk about losing somebody. That's for eternity, brothers and sisters. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is God's power for salvation. And I love this, guys, okay, because in verses 2 and 4 of this chapter, Paul literally gave us the essence of the gospel, which, again, is Christ. He's the center of the gospel. He's the source of the, the power of the gospel. But here in verse 16 and 17, he's giving us the function of the gospel. And it literally is, again, to save. What does he say there in verse 5? Again, Romans 1, 5, he says, to bring about the obedience of faith. The function of the gospel is to save. And brothers and sisters, the gospel is absolutely good news, okay? But it's not just information. It has the power to save those who believe it. It is power. Those who believe it, guys all because of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, when we believe it, I want you to see this, right? Because we often might think, man, I'm a, I, you know, gosh, I, I must have some power because I get saved by believing the gospel. Listen to this, guys. When we believe it, we don't give power to the gospel to save us, okay? All we've done is merely got out of the way and stopped hindering it from saving us. The gospel is the power of God for salvation with or without you and I. Now, that word salvation, it's the Greek word soteria, which means deliverance, preservation, safety. It's where we get our word soteriology, which, is, which just is the study of salvation. You often hear somebody say, my doctrine on soteriology is this, okay? Literally, it just means how to be saved. This gospel, though, there's all kinds of implications. How to be saved, okay? It's how to be saved from God's final wrath and judgment. And guys, verses 18 through 32, Paul actually writes about the wrath of God, about how God's wrath is in the world now and about his final wrath that's coming later. But in regards to God's final wrath and, and how we're saved from God's final wrath through, through the gospel, Salvation, the salvation of God also has a present meaning for us today, guys. It literally means that we have a secure hope for glory and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. And so what I want to say and I want to encourage you guys today is that, brothers and sisters, we will suffer in the brokenness of this life and in this world. But, but one day, brothers and sisters, one day soon, there will be no more suffering. 
God literally will wipe away every tear from our eyes. God literally will take away death. He'll take away mourning and crying. He'll take away pain and all of the things of this world, all the brokenness and the wickedness and the sinfulness and the death and the corruption, the decay, all of those things that were ushered in by the fall of man, all those things will pass away. Thank you, Jesus. Continuing there, he says, to everyone who believes, the gospel is God's power of salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek, or also to the Greek, I should say. All right, guys, just real quick. There's a singularness about the Greek in this part of the verse. When it says to everyone, there's a singularness there. When it says to the Jew, there's singularness there. And then to the Greek, there's singularness, singularness there. Okay, this is singular, literally showing that there must be an individual response of faith to God's gospel message of saving grace. And God's gospel message of saving grace, it doesn't matter your religion or your race, all right? It doesn't matter, guys, okay? The gospel is for everybody who believes. Now, there is a priority here. He says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Um, who got the gospel first? Well, Jesus brought the gospel first to the Jew, right? And then through Jews, what happened? The gospel was delivered to the Gentiles. So there is this priority there, okay? But there's an equality there with the benefits of the gospel. The fact that Jews and Greeks alike receive it through faith. And when they do, they're saved. Let's continue there, verse 17. There's that word for again. It's another conjunction. <laughs> he says, for in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so, guys, each time the gospels proclaimed, God's righteousness is revealed. You see this? It says, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. The gospel brings people to faith in Jesus when they hear about what God has done through Jesus' death and resurrection. Guys, every time, every time the gospel is proclaimed, God's righteousness is revealed. Even still today, guys. Please know that when you proclaim the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. The righteousness of God, again, this statement is between two statements. The first statement is the power of God. It's the power of God for salvation. The second statement is that it is God's wrath, I should say. It sits between those two verses. All right, guys? I just got to quick, quickly say this because I know that we're, we're running short on time here. But what I want you to see in that is that God's righteousness is seen in his salvation that comes through his son, but it's also seen in his wrath. And I don't know if you guys see that, but this is what I want to say. I wish I could say more on this, but whether or not we receive salvation through faith in Jesus or we receive wrath's God as unbelievers, God is righteous. You guys see that? God's righteousness is revealed in both. It's revealed in our salvation because of what Jesus has done, I'll say it again, and it's revealed in his wrath for those who ultimately do not choose Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, his righteousness is revealed. Let's finish up there. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna finish up with 17. I wish I can go to 18, but for the sake of time. He says, again, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so, brothers and sisters, what Paul is writing here is that it's only through faith that we can receive salvation. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we need to bring to the table. There's nothing we need to add. Okay, guys? It's only by faith. When he says from faith for faith, some of your translations say from faith to faith, he's literally saying that we can only be saved by grace through faith. Now, I wish I can say more here, guys, but I, I want to close here because we, we, we're going to do communion. But, but, but what I want you guys to see here, guys, is the righteousness of God, okay? God is righteous whether or not we're saved. 
You guys see this? God is righteous whether or not we're saved. Jesus Christ justifies us with what he has done. And in that, God can say, believer, enter into the, to my kingdom where there is peace, there is joy, there is harmony, no more corruption or death or sin for all eternity. You are in fellowship with me, right? And God is righteous when he unleashes his wrath on people because humanity is fallen. Humanity is sinful. And we'll see that in the, in the verses next week. <clears throat> Romans 18, or 1, 18 through 32. But I just want to say that today, guys, that look, Paul's revealing that God's gospel reveals God's righteousness. And it is a gift given through faith. And I hope that all of you today will have a heart like Paul. I hope that you guys will not only speak the gospel, proclaim the gospel of Jesus, Right, like Paul just so passionately did. But I pray that you will live it out. And I pray that you will not be embarrassed or ashamed by it. And I pray that you will realize that it's God's power. It's God's power to save. It literally is God's righteousness. The last thing I want to say, guys, is uh, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior today, I invite you, and more importantly, God invites you to come into a saving faith to repent of your sin and place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus is our only hope. He's the only hope of man, a fallen man, to be redeemed. Um, and again, God has given us this gift uh, of faith that we can believe and he'll give us his grace and be saved. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, uh, for just the truth of your righteousness, God, that regardless of whether believers are saved in heaven, uh, believers who once were fallen, believers who were sinners, who practiced ungodliness and unrighteousness, whether or not they're in heaven by the blood of Jesus, who is our righteousness, or unbelievers who you unleash your wrath upon them, you are still righteous, God. You still stand righteous. And so we thank you so much, God, for the truth of your righteousness, God. And I just pray, God, that it would stir our hearts, God, for those that are hearing the message today that don't know you, Lord, that they would see, God, that you are righteous in judging them if that's where, where, where they end up, God. But I pray that they would see it, God, that it would cause them to turn, that they would turn and they would place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ and receive the gift of salvation, literally becoming the righteousness of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5. I thank you so much for that gift, Lord. And I also want to pray for all of us who are believers, that maybe we've been afraid or timid with the gospel, with proclaiming the gospel. Lord God, you are righteous in saving us because of Jesus. Gosh, we should be shouting that at the rooftops. So often we will run and tell a friend about our favorite team who won a football game or a, or a basketball game. And, and even a friend that we know is not a fan. But yet, God, we won't tell our friends about you. We won't tell our friends your gospel, Lord. I pray, Father, that we would be like Paul and not be ashamed of the gospel, but that we'd be bold and realize its power, its power to save, and realize the need of fallen man, that they need to be saved, God, because of your impending wrath on this broken world and on all who choose Christ not. I pray that we would have a sense of urgency, God, and again, that we would be bold by your spirit. Help us, we pray, God, by your spirit, as apart from you, we cannot do it. But we know that in you, Lord, we can do all things. Help us, we pray, God. Again, Father, we love you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, continue to reign in this service. And again, Lord God, be glorified by all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. few things to be thankful for and uh, some other requests. Um, first is my mom's here today. It's been two months since she's been here, so that's a big praise that she's 
healed well enough to get back for that. Um, please be praying for Diane Fish, not here today, uh, healing for her back. Still praying for Pastor Sister Tanya Sablon. Um, just asking for God's direction in her life right now. Um, praying for Tracy and Danielle Wallace, um, Daisha Jacobson, David Espinoza, Grandma Margaret, um, for healing. Those are all uh, requests there for physical healing. Um, please pray for the youth group, um, kind of that we would finish out the summer strong, but that they would be preparing uh, for the school year and beyond as that comes. And just that we would see greater numbers and greater depth of life in Christ. And then uh, there's going to be a youth group car wash uh, for Timberland. Please be, please be praying for it as well, um, kind of as our final summer uh, event that we have happening. And help uh, just ask that we would have God's understanding of how to meet this community's needs, how we can uh, share the gospel more effectively, whether that's as individuals or as a church, that, that God would just give us his insight on how he would have us do that, that he would give us a boldness in doing that as well. And then uh, one more praise to end it, and that is Pastor's sister, uh, Tanya. She's looking for some of that God's direction, but, but also got the job that she was looking for, so we can be praising uh, him for that. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come to you. We can thank and praise you for uh, healing and recovery. Um, thank and praise you for uh, my mom being here today and Tanya's job. Lord, we can look to you as well for our needs. And we just ask that you would be um, with those who need healing. Specifically, I think of Diane and how she's absent today. And uh, just ask that you would heal her back and that we would have her back uh, with us soon. Lord, we know that you love this community more than we do, even though we love it a great deal. Lord, we ask that you would continue to make ways for us, that you would open ways for us to share your gospel, that you would give us a boldness to pound through some ways that seem blocked, that we would not be passive, but that we would be active, that we would not act like we were unarmed, but that we were armed with a double-edged sword. Lord, we thank and praise you for all that you do and how you sit on the throne. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's also a time of communion, and uh, That, that word always gets me, you know. It, we kind of use words sometimes, and they, they kind of take on a, a, a meaning and outside of, of what they do. It almost seems like it's a ceremony that that, that communion means. But, but communion really is just that interaction, that close interaction, that close relationship with someone. We can do that from a distance, but really we need to do that close up, one-on-one. -on -one. It's nice to have my mom here. It's, it's different than the communion we can have praying for her every week. Right? It's different than um, when you go and visit someone as opposed to just talking about them on the phone or thinking fondly of them or remembering them in your prayers. And that's what communion does for us as well. See, Jesus wants that to be close. He wants us to be closer than a husband and wife. Heather and I get pretty busy sometimes, and, and you go long stretches where you know the other one cares for you. You know what they're doing and what, what's going on. But it doesn't necessarily isn't the same as when you come home and you're able to sit and talk or lay in the bed and talk for uh, a while and reconnect. And God is instituted communion and I think that's one of the reasons why. It's not that he's not with us, but he says when two or three come together in my name I am there among you and I think that's different than him just living in our hearts. It's a different sense of his presence 
And so when we come together today for communion, let's commune with him and with each other. That we are here worshiping him, that we are here thinking of him and talking to him and listening to him as well. Thinking of his sacrifice and all that he's done for us and how much he loves us. Let me pray and then we will partake. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that your son did. And we thank you that he thought enough to bring us back and have a special time of relationship and communion with him and with each other. Lord, as we take it today, Lord, help us to remember the sacrifices that he's made and turn those in to a passion to reach those around us with that same loving grace and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. And he took the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you.
you please stand for our last song if you're able to? you, Lord, and we thank you for this time, Father God, and this service, Lord, that you blessed us with. Bless the rest of our time, Lord, and this fellowship, Lord. May your spirit be present, and may we glorify you, Father God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, and have a blessed week.